Good morning, everyone. We're going, we're going to try to start as close on time as possible, but uh, happy uh, Thursday and uh, welcome to our uh, Public Works Committee meeting. We have uh, two uh, very important items on the agenda, and as soon as we have a quorum, we will get started. Morning, Ms. Clark. Good morning again.
Good morning, Councilman. Evan Hayes. I need one more council person.
Well, we, we, what, what, we're going to start. I don't definitely, especially like to respect people's time. Uh, we're going to start as an informational meeting. You can call the roll, uh, uh, Ms. Kern, please. Roll call. Council Member Thomas. Here. Council Member Jerusa. Here. Council, Council Member Harris. Council Member King. Council Member Green. We do not have a quorum. Uh, we, we don't have a, for, a quorum, but so we can't approve the. Uh, uh, the minutes, but what we can do is start presentations. And uh, number three, M Madam Carr, Ms. Carr? Yes, sir. We have a Department of Sanitation with a discussion on an update on the curbside collections and upcoming service area one and two RFPs, and a discussion um, on the current trash contract as it relates to trash and recycling collection. Mr. Tory, uh, let everyone, let the audience know who you are, and please start your presentation. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I am Matt Torrey, director for the Department of Sanitation. Mr. Torrey. All right. Well, thank you as always for uh, having me here. Uh, I'm excited. Are you sure? Oh, I, it's amazing how many people Can say we that. Can vote on that? Uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Mr. No, no. But but today, uh, you know, is, is different maybe from past my past recent times. I have a lot of actually positive things to talk about and share. So I'm, I'm excited to be here, excited to talk about, you know, the positive things that are happening in sanitation across the city um, and, and build that momentum, you know, with the residents here. So the first thing uh, that we're going to talk about are updates for uh, new contracts for service area two and service area three. So I think the city has been steadfast in our commitment uh, to the process that has been underway for the past year to bring about new contracts uh, for service what was previously referred to as service area two, which was the Metro service group service area, um, which we're now split into two service areas. We have service area two, which is uh, going to be serviced by Ivy Waste and Service Area 3, which will be serviced by Waste Pro of Louisiana. But we've been steadfast in our commitment uh, to, to tracking to our transition, uh, which has been announced for some time now for November 7th. Um, we did have a, you know, a, 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 some challenges that, that presented themselves recently with Metro Service Group filing for Chapter 11 bankruptcy on Oct October 6th, seeking to prevent the city from terminating their contract. But in no way is, is that going to prevent uh, the Department of Sanitation or the City of New Orleans from continuing to move forward with preparations for November 7th and delivering on the promise that we made over a year ago to provide enhanced services, uh, improved quality of life for the residents of Service Area 2. So uh, in, the, in the next week, residents will begin to receive uh, uh, items in the mail, which will make this very real for them. Uh, you see here some screenshots of some of the uh, magnets that will be delivered to service area two, service area three. So critical information will be is included on these magnets. Uh, first and foremost is the collection day for the location. So some locations in service area two, uh, starting on November 7th, will have uh, a new collection day associated with the new contracts for IV Waste and Waste Pro. Uh, the driving force behind this is is the new contractors will only be providing service Monday through Friday, five days a week, not six days a week. We won't be having collections in service area two on Saturdays. Uh, we had through these contracts, you know, uh, we have additional equipment. We have new types of equipment. We have additional resources. Both of our contractors have adequate capacity to provide all of the, the contractual services within the five days, not six. That means no trucks will be running in service area two on the, on the weekend, which is a great thing. Um, the other big changes is that recycling, of course, starts back day one, November 7th with the new contracts and everyone's trash and recycling day will happen on the same day. So you will have two trucks, which will visit your house, one for trash, one for recycling, but it'll happen on the same day. So again, ultimately reducing the number of, of times heavy equipment is in neighborhoods throughout the city, having that happen on the same day. So, so big, big pluses there. Um, as from a resident's perspective, again, they don't want to pay attention to the mailer, don't want to pay attention to the collection day that's listed there. 
If for some reason they want to go ahead and look early, they can go to NOLA.gov, the where you at feature at the bottom. If you type into your address, it'll tell you your current and your future collection days. If you go to NOLA.gov slash sanitation, there's also a scheduling page there. It'll tell you that information as well. Really, we're seeking to, to, to you know, drive home the core, core critical information for residents around trash and recycling collection as these new collection contracts start, proper containment of your trash, um, when to put that trash out, right? So that no one should be putting their trash out before 4 p.m. the day prior to your collection day. What is eligible for bulky waste, how that bulky waste gets collect, what shouldn't go in the trash when it comes uh, to hazardous items. And then really, and I'll touch on this more on the next slide, a, a refresher around the restart of recycling. Since we have not had curbside recycling for over a year in service area too. Um, of course, uh, residents should continue to use 311 to submit their service requests. Um, they've been doing it for the past year, but they should continue to be. That will be our method for uh, de dealing with complaints and addressing service requests, but especially around carts. So if residents are in need of a replacement trash cart, um, we also are offering part of this, this new contract with Ivy and Noise Pro second trash carts for, for uh, households at no charge. That service request is active. So if residents wanna go ahead and request their second trash cart uh, for free from the city to help with containment with once a week trash collection. They're, they're free to go ahead and do that now and get in the queue for November 7th, which would be great. Um, but also for, for those repair and replacements, which we know some households have been uh, waiting a very long time to see action on that. Um, we've already started to see dividends on these new contracts already. Um, both our new contractors, uh, uh, through through proactive goodwill went and delivered over 3,600 trash carts to uh, locations that have been languishing, waiting for trash carts, repair, replacements, or issues over the past year from our current service provider. So they went ahead ahead of time uh, and brought in uh, resources to be able to deliver those uh, carts over 3,600 two weeks ago. It was a monumental task, but I think uh, the, the simple act of receiving a trash cart couldn't have brought more joy to certain people to be able to have a functioning trash cart that they could use to contain their debris uh, on a daily basis. So um, we have a you know, big announcement today at one o'clock um, in, in alignment with these new contracts. I think the excitement is there. I think their hope from residents has been there and they've been very patient with the city as we work through this process over the past year. But I think now that hope is transitioning into an excitement and, and really excitement around those improved services, those enhanced services, the improved quality of life that we know is going to come with these new contracts uh, effective November 7th. So I know you all have been uh, you know, invited, made aware of this, this event today at one. We really hope that you all will be there. We know that the council has been on the receiving end of many of the complaints regarding trash collection in, in service area two over the past year because you shared them with us. Uh, promptly. So we, we look forward to continuing, you know, to work with the council and of course the council supporting the city and residents and receiving these enhanced services that they've been so patiently waiting for over the past year. I touched on the restart of curbside recycling for service area two. This is, this is huge for the city, right? Service area two is the one area that uh, did not restart recycling after Hurricane Ida. Um, it comprises, you know, a little under half of the, the service locations for the city. So a big area there as part of the new contracts. Curbside recycling is back day one, uh, November 7th. As I mentioned, residents will receive trash and recycling service on the same day uh, via different collection equipment. But we uh, were very fortunate enough to receive a grant from the Recycling Partnership uh, recently, which happened to work out uh, perfectly with the timing of the new contracts to provide the city with additional, with funding for additional recycling carts, recycling stickers, uh, education and outreach materials uh, with the goal of enhancing the city's curbside recycling program. So on this slide, you see some examples of, again, some direct mail that's gonna hit residents' mailbox over the next week uh, in service across, across the city. We know we have some legacy black recycling carts that were issued early on uh, when curbside recycling was restarted they pose problems uh, for us because they look very similar to trash carts and often are confused with that. 
So for any location that was previously issued a black recycling cart in the next week, they'll receive a mailer. Inside that mailer, it'll have a six by nine recycling sticker with instructions on how to affix that sticker to the top of your black recycling cart. And you can kind of see here on the right of the slide what that looks like. Um, it'll also have some educational and outreach materials in there around how to properly recycle, what goes in your cart, what doesn't go in your cart, how to request a cart if you don't have one and so on. In service area two, uh, obviously the residents that have black carts will receive that, that label as well as that information, but they'll also receive a separate mailer, really stressing the fact that recycling is back November 7th, the service is beginning, and how, and how to prepare yourself to, again, participate in curbside recycling. So if you already have a cart, how to ensure you know what goes in that cart. And you see here, right? Cardboard, paper, plastic, uh, small metals, aluminum and tin cans, obviously are what we collect curbside. What we don't collect, uh, we don't collect any bags whatsoever. So, so we shouldn't have any plastic bags in there. People shouldn't be bagging their recycling and putting it into their cart to go loosely into the recycling cart. Certainly no glass or foods or liquids and no styrofoam, which is something that we commonly find there, styrofoam or, or films. But the materials are really focused around educating residents on restarting, how to participate. If folks don't have a recycling cart, they should immediately uh, put a request into 301. The Department of Sanitation is promptly fulfilling those requests uh, within two to three weeks. So we will get a new blue recycling cart out to you. Uh, ASAP so that you can join uh, join in the restart of curbside recycling come no November 7th in service area two and three. The next item I'm gonna to touch on is an update on service area one uh, regarding the uh, performance metrics that we, that we looked at the last time I was here uh, before council. So um, service area one uh, is is the area comprised of the, uh, you know, the Uptown University, Central City, um, as well as the West Bank area currently serviced by Richard's uh, disposal. During the, the last uh, committee meeting that I was here, we looked at some data points uh, around complaints uh, for miscollections uh, in service area one, which have seen a significant escalation in 2022. Uh, I, wish, I wish I was coming here to talk about changes and better results that maybe have happened in service area one since I was here in August, but that unfortunately isn't the case. Uh, if you see here on our charts below, um, specifically the chart on the right, which shows you the monthly miscollection complaints uh, for Richards in service area one, you see a, a spike, a dramatic spike that happened again in September, uh, over 936 missed trash collection complaints, 300 uh, missed recycling complaints, so very, very big numbers there. Uh, unfortunately, you know, despite you know numerous requests by the city, we really are just uh, not seeing any sustain sustainable steps taken by Richards to mitigate these persistent complaints uh, that are happening there. So while uh, they're persistent uh, and and uh, we get these complaints on a daily basis, um, we're not seeing action that would, would that, would, that Richards would take to to stymie them. Uh, going forward on a, on a permanent basis. Uh, I, I want to stop here. Usually, you know, I, I like the presentation and hear from my colleagues uh, first, but uh, as chair, you want to absorb all the information and comment later. But th this has been so public. So what you're saying is that despite the problems in the past, and despite the fact that you guys have put the, the, the contractor on notice, that no steps have been taken to curb or stop the missing collection complaints that we've had? I can tell, I don't want to say that no steps haven't been taken. Uh, I think that would be too broad. I, we know that Richard's disposal has entered into a subcontractor agreement with another company to hopefully receive additional support. Um, but those resources have not come to bear, obviously. While they entered into an agreement, we're not seeing those additional supplemental resources on the routes to stop the complaints. So to your point, unfortunately, no, we're not seeing direct action leading to better results. So what happens if so if, if it's if it's a miss, and that's that's a lot, a thousand and then this month nine hundred. If it's a missed trash collection, does it just wait until the next collection period or is it mitigated somehow by someone getting that complaint or you guys monitoring the complaint and then getting them to send some, someone out to pick up the trash? So what, what happens? Yep. So when a missed collection complaint comes in, it, it, it's directly sent to the service provider, you know, who services that area. And then for per the, per our contract, they have 24 hours to, to, 
uh, resolve it. Otherwise, they potentially can face a, a damage assessment, a fine, right? Ideally, that all collections should be occurring on their schedule collection day. We know that's not happening. So what we do see is, yes, Richards is generally getting to the missed collection complaints within the next day, but the frustration and the persistent nature of them it doesn't go over well with residents, right? They expect their trash to be collected on their scheduled trash collection day. When it doesn't, it leads to issues with trash hitting on the curb. And it's not universal that they ought, that the, it is being picked up within one day. And that's why I asked the question. So they're usually getting it within 24 hours. So we're not seeing the trash pile up at that same location that was missed until the next trash pickup day. Not not on a universal basis. We certainly have some uh, pockets of, of incidents like that where uh, where we do get complaints where residents are saying that they've gone a week without collection and that we are you know pushing those as priority locations. Okay, we'll get back to, back, get back to that. Do, Councilman Jerusalem, do you have anything on, on this issue? Because I know this is a major problem. It, uh, I have a couple of questions. Uh, Councilmember Harris has a bunch of questions. Yeah. If you'd like me to ask, Mr. Tory, you want to? I, I yeah. defer to the chair on how you want to handle. Yeah, yeah. I, I just on this issue, we've had so many people that have complained about missed pickups, and and he said there's a process for it. So I just wanted the public to know, well, what's the process, and it, and if it was a problem before, why is it still a problem? If the if we've taken steps to remedy it, well, I guess how to stop it. That's what I don't understand. Well, one of the questions I was going to ask, Matt, is there have been letters sent by the administration to Richards saying that you have the potential to be in default. Um, those have been sent, so they are on notice. I am not rooting for any company to fail. We want people to be successful. With that said, where do we stand in process now? Yeah, I, I think the last time we were here, we talked about this. The, uh, the Metro bankruptcy filing kind of uh, threw a wrench into uh, what we where we were moving on service area one. So I think we're we're on, I'm not going to say we're at a pause, but we're we're certainly at a pause when it would come to take any action with regards to their anybody any other sanitation contracts right now until the bankruptcy proceedings play out. But I can tell you that I mean this is an issue that I interact with many of your offices on a daily basis for uh, prolonged periods of time. It, it's frustrating. It's exhausting. I know it's exhausting to you all. I know your residents are very vocal in the fact that they expect their trash to be picked up on the collection day. They expect it to be picked up completely on their collection day and that they're paying for that service and, and, and they expect it. And I think from our perspective, we are going to seek action to make that happen. And, uh, and I, I started off positively talking about the path that the city has been on for service area two to get us where we need to be for there and cure the defects that have been happening there. Be purely, uh, purely or clearly we have, you know, an issue in service area one that is not getting better, unfortunately, and is gonna ultimately have to have some action taken to provide the services that residents deserve. Well, I, I'll just say this, I assumed, but you've now confirmed that the bankruptcy is playing a part in what happens in service area one. Just very quickly on the bankruptcy, has Metro, and you may not know the answer, I'm need to ask the lawyers, has Metro formally assumed the contract in the bankruptcy proceedings? Uh, Metro did file a motion to assume, assume the contract via the, the bankruptcy proceedings. And the city, you know, I can tell you, and you may be aware of it, but the city filed our motion uh, yesterday for relief from the automatic stay. So. Well, that, that was good. And, and you sort of anticipated my next question, which ha has, has the court ruled yet on compliance? So it sounds like what met and, and again, I want to make sure we're all very clear here. So Metro can say with respect to this contract, one of two things, either we assume, accept the contract, and that's accept all of it, or they reject the contract, right? Correct. And then the second part of that then is the city says, we don't see compliance. That's the motion it just filed. And then the third part is for the court to determine whether or not Metro is meeting the obligations now that it's agreed to assume the contract. Yep. Correct. So I expect that we will, both parties will be in front of the federal bankruptcy judge next week on both of those All right. motions. All right. And do, do you have any, I know things move with rapidity in bankruptcy court. Um, for our sake, it might be helpful if that was before next Thursday when, when the, the contracts right. are before us. I mean, I'm just trying to help us out as much as, and the city to make sure that we're all on the same page. I know we don't have control, but the earlier there's a ruling or at least some guidance that would be appreciated. 
Yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll know shortly. I think, you know, this week we probably will have a date when that hearing is going to be. But I think from, you know, from our perspective, I think we also want to make clear, right, our contract with Metro is non-exclusive. It doesn't prevent the city from taking action with regards to other contracts. The city has been on a path for the past year uh, to, to solicit, award, and transition to these new contracts for Ivy Waste and Waste Pro that residents have been clamoring for and the council as well. I mean, I have sat at this table, I can't tell you how many times over the past year and got beat over the head about when is trash collection gonna get better? When are we gonna have the new contracts? I think we are on the cusp of being there and we're taking that step. And I sincerely hope that the council will support us in our actions to get over that last hurdle and be ready for November 7th. Yeah, I, I just, I think what we're all just trying to way through is you're hundred percent right where we have absolute alignment in my view is that everybody wants trash collected they want it done well they want to make sure that the provider whoever it is is meeting the residents needs the only trick spot is we're in litigation and and how do we make sure that um everything is being done correctly that's all so i think i think you matt you're hundred percent right um and, and for the record, we don't want to have to have you at the table as much as we do. And we prefer for you to be able to operate without seeing you so much. So we, we hope to get that resolved sooner rather than later. And, and, thing, and, and I, I think that's why I thought it was important to at least pause in this presentation, because they have over a thousand missed uh, collection complaints uh, in May. And then approaching another thousand in September, you would have thought that in the interim, uh, there would have been some remedy. You know, the most important thing here is that pe people want to know that collection day is collection day. Yeah, not, it's not it's, not put because right now what we have is put your trash out day. And put your trash out day doesn't always translate an equal collection day. It's it's we've taken for granted simple pieces of the trash collection process. One, that your trash could collect it on the, the day it's scheduled Two that it'll get collected completely. Three, that no mess will be left when it gets collected, right? And, and lastly, that recycling will be a part of that mix, right? We've gone without it for so long, and we've, we've ex not, I'm not going to say we've accepted, but we've tolerated bad service that I think going forward, the uh, clear difference between the service that we've been receiving and the service that we are about to begin receiving on no November 7th will be uh, startling. Right and 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 noticeable to residents because of what we've all been dealing with for the past year. Well, C Councilman, my, my sister told me a couple of weeks ago. She said that at their house they do uh, do you hit a truck day. Right. Yeah, right. because they don't put it out too early because of the animals and and that part of these possums and you know so so they, what they would do is somebody is up early if you hit a truck. Then you start rolling you it start out. Start rolling that out. You, you can finish your presentation, please. Sure. And and feel free to stop me at any yeah. point because there well, are we, different oh, topics. We, yeah, no, we will. Great. Thank thank you, Mr. Story. Uh, another another you know huge positive for us, and this this came as a, a direct request from you all at the council, right? So over the past uh, uh, month, we installed over forty no dumping signs across all the council districts. So this was a part of the first grouping of a hundred dump, no dumping signs that we ordered. Um, DPW worked collaboratively with us to install those first 40 signs. The remaining signs from that first grouping will be installed across the council districts um, over, the, over November. And then through the mid-year budget, you all uh, provided us with funding to buy another 200 signs, which the order has been placed for. So we'll hopefully have those you know, before the end of the year and can work on installing those. But I mean, they're out there now, they're invisible, they're noticeable, and hopefully they will uh, coincide with an overall enforcement policy going forward that will hopefully reduce illegal dumping, which we all know that we're battling. Um, also, as part of the mid-year budget, you know, the council provided the Department of Sanitation with money to activate our, our contractors to pick up illegal dumping. Uh, many folks have seen those contractors out in the communities already. We have three crews out there running uh, on contract uh, on five days a week. 10 hours a day, picking up illegal dumping, working our backlog of over, over 1,500 requests. Um, I think they're very visible. I've heard from many residents that they've seen them there, they've seen them working, they've seen the debris get picked up. So I think we're really excited about the fact that by the end of the year, we may be close to caught up on that illegal dumping backlog with the help of those contractors. 
say that again? I think by the end of the year, we're optimistic that we will be caught up on our legal dumping backlog. Well, I know Councilmember Harris was here. She put on a chili enough and for that one. No, no, that's right. I can't say stuff like that. Yeah. Anymore. She would be re real happy. She'd be happy. She'd be happy. Now, having uh, the Department of Sanitation runs one illegal dumping crew a day. So obviously having three additional crews is a force multiplier for us. I mean, it's huge uh, in our in our productivity. Um, this isn't to say, as you all know, we clean a location and then we come back the next day and what's what's there? New stuff, which is which is the most frustrating part about this city and what we do. And that's our larger enforcement problem. But 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 debris is getting picked up in large vo large volumes on a daily basis right now. That's headline news there. Yeah. yeah. Okay. It's huge, right? Yeah. Um, I think it, we've we've said this, right? Unfortunately, we need resources to pick up illegal dumping. It's pervasive it's in every neighborhood. Uh, the Department of Sanitation has a limited number of people currently. We certainly don't have the resources to keep up with the pace. Having having an additional three crews out there with us is is a game changer. Wanted to also give an update on the convenience centers. So these are the facilities that are online uh, to come on in the future where residents will be able to visit for free and drop off trash. Uh, this is actually a picture of one of the convenience centers in Jefferson Parish, just so people can see really what it looks like, the raised concrete platform with the uh, roll off containers around it where you drive up, you throw your trash in, you leave. Um, so we have an RFQ out, uh, the first one, which didn't receive any respondents for design, which closes tomorrow. Uh, the selection committee for design of these facilities is scheduled for November 10th, and then we're looking, you know, hopefully to move forward quickly with construction uh, for these. It's not a lot, you know, the, it's not very complicated to raise concrete platforms, some concrete panels, but these uh, are critical, again, to helping to, to stymie illegal dumping, give residents options for uh, disposal debris so that we know we have the two initial locations identified in New Orleans East, as well as the West Bank. We're still searching for a location in Central City, which will comply with the code and also not, not negatively impact neighborhoods. Um, so we're always open for suggestion on those, but, but these facilities will play into our overall strategy of providing increased uh, services, curbside via our new contracts, additional uh, uh, services available to residents via the drop-off so that they can utilize these for things that maybe aren't eligible uh, for curbside collection, if they're doing a home renovation, if they're doing a large uh, yard work project, any of those things, they could bring these those items to the drop-offs for free to really help uh, reduce that overall volume of illegal dumping. The last update I wanted to, to give on again, it, it ties into this on enforcement was around civ the civilian employee deputization. So this has been a big topic for years right, around sanitation rangers being deputized so that they can actually enforce uh, some of the municipal code versus just issuing warnings. I can tell you this afternoon, they will actually be have their oath swearing in ceremony with Chief Ferguson, a uh, huge milestone uh, for the city for sanitation to have that happen. So the rangers will be sworn in our initial rollout of the deputization process. <laughs> You know, we'll be very focused on data collection and process improvement. It'll still be soft touch at first as we are engaging with residents. We, will, we have said all along, we will continue to issue warnings and be progressive. Uh, but now we, we will have that stick that we didn't previously have where our rangers will be able to actually issue citations for, you know, very severe violations. So another huge positive, uh, you know, for sanitation. Thank you. I think that's the end of your presentation. Councilmember Jerusa. Yes, I'm now going to ask you Councilmember Harris's questions. Um, so the, the first couple matter about Richards. How often does the Department of Sanitation meet with Richards disposal to discuss their challenges with pickups? I speak with uh, supervisors from Richards disposal every every day, every evening uh, at the end of their collections. Uh, okay. And then um, what is the status of Richard Disposal utilizing a subcontractor with Romelli? That's the one you were alluding to earlier. Yeah. So, so my in my understanding uh, is that the you know I know that the subcontractor agreement was executed, but uh, Richard's Disposal is not receiving support from Romelli Waste on a regular, regular and consistent basis. Is is 
there are anybody else they're receiving? Now, this is a joke question. Are they receiving no, assistance no. from anybody else on a they, regular They're basis? not. Uh, there certainly are other players in our region, right? And I think that has one, been one of the uh, constant uh, requests that we've made of Richards is to exhaust all of your available options in this region for supplemental support. And there clearly are other vendors who could step in and provide support. Thank you. From the 311 data you've analyzed where, well, I think you just showed that in the slide, where is the Richards disposal compared to 2021? We'll make sure uh, Councilmember Harris sees that. Um, the Richards disposal contract, uh, if left to its own devices, Matt, expires in 25 or 24? March of 2024. March of 2024. And then moving on, during the August 25th public works meeting, it was mentioned that within the next 30 to 45 days, the city will decide whether to issue a new curbside collection for service area one. Again, I assume that's been put on hold as a result of the bank. Put on hold, look for, you know, look for an update immediately following, you know, what the city expects will be action from the, in the federal bankruptcy court lifting the automatic stay. Got it. All right, then the next question is about glass recycling. Councilmember Harris says she was incredibly happy to connect you and your team of folks at Glass Half Full. Um, she says, for anyone who isn't familiar with them, please check them out. They're turning recycled glass into sand that is being used to restore the coastline. Is there an update on the status of the partnership between the city and Glass Half Full? Yeah, so uh, again, we thank Councilmember Harris for that connection as well. Glass Half Full is a, you know, a wonderful, uh, operation, uh, inspiring story, you know, local business and, and what they're doing there. We met with their leadership team uh, after the last time we were here talking about how the Department of Sanitation potentially can, can divert the glass that we currently accept on a weekly basis at our drop off to their facility for processing. So I think we have agreement, you know, and that that is something we both want to do. And for the beginning of next year, we're working, working to figure out those details to how that we can begin to you know, when we collect glass on a weekly basis, instead of taking it to Mississippi, as which we would do right now for recycling, why can't we take it 10 minutes away to Louisa Street and give it the glass half full with all the wonderful things they're doing with the glass? Yeah, that's fantastic. I think Young Leadership Council is doing stuff with them too, so it's good to see. Um, Council Member Harris's next question, what is the current status of the tire shredder and what are the biggest challenges with the Never utilization of it? Yeah, so, you know, when we, we received a capital budget allocation for a, a tire shredder, the, the critical path for that was, was the first was figuring out what is the aftermarket when you shred a tire, right? And it's one thing to accept the tire and process it, but you have to have somewhere where it goes to. And that's the fundamental issue that we face as a state and as a country is that there's limited markets that, that exist for what you do with tires. I think we don't have an answer to that. We've seen other parishes actually in this state go out, buy tire shredders and have masses of shredded tire sitting on municipal uh, land and with no way to get rid of it right now because there is no market for it. So until we have uh, a clear answer on, on where that market would be, where, where that shredded tire could go to, we, we really can't move forward with making a purchase of that significance for a tire shredder. Um, we currently pick up waste tires via the state's waste tire program as a department between thirty and fifty thousand dollars a year. We bring them to Colt uh, uh, Tires on New Orleans East, which is the, the region's processor for no cost. I mean, no cost other than the cost it takes for us to run crews and pick them up. Right, we're not paying a processing fee, uh, and Colt is then processing those tires and and sending them to an aftermarket. So I think we also have to be mindful of. Um, the cost that might go along with shredding tires. Clearly there's the upfront capital cost, but you also have to have people that are gonna operate that tire shredder. You're gonna transport shredded tires. Um, you have to have a reliable aftermarket to accept them and so on. So until we have a clear uh, you know, strategy and plan on all of those, I think the purchase of a tire shredder is on hold. Has there been thought about just making an RFP for who does shred tires with Colt or somebody. I'm not advocating for any one agency or group, but a thought about not buying a tire shredder and seven contracts. So somebody shreds and disposes. I think we've given thought to, if we decided to move forward with the tire shredder, we certainly would look to fold in the operation of that with one of the convenience centers that's gonna stand up. Um, it makes sense for it to be there. Um, some of, several of them, at least one of them has enough land to accommodate that. And we would fold in the 
services associated with operating the tire shredder into that professional services agreement because we do envision outside parties operating the convenience centers once they launch. Okay. And then you answered her second to last questions about the convenience centers. And then the last one, she says, I want to thank you and your team for helping with the first district B neighborhood cleanup day and the recent cleanup under the Claiborne overpass with Sage, her office and all the volunteers district B next cleanup day is December 3rd from 9 AM to 12. Her office will be promoting these locations across her district soon. It's a truly incredible thing because people contact District B office all the time, wanting to get involved and help with these efforts. Will the Department of Sanitation be able to not just continue these cleanup days, but expand them outside of District B? So she asked that on behalf of all of us. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, I think we as a department for for as long as I've been there, so you know, for ten years now, uh, have have always made ourselves available to assist with uh, cl neighborhood cleanups. So, uh, outside of District B, I mean, neighborhood cleanups happen on a smaller scale, admittedly, um, throughout all of the districts, and we are there supporting them. I know there are several cleanups scheduled for this weekend. I know most recently we did some um, under the St. Claude Bridge with uh, the Sankofa organization. Uh, we did, we're obviously a part of the Lincoln Beach cleanup that happened recently. So I think we are 100% are committed to supporting any organic uh, neighborhood or council cleanup that's happening and playing the role that we can, which is picking up and disposing of the debris. I wish we had more resources where we could actually have boots on the ground next to the people doing the cleanup. Uh, unfortunately, you know, working 365 days a year, seven days a week, we have limited staff available to kind of participate in those extra things outside of our core duties. But certainly we are available. We have a guide that we provide to groups if they're going to do a cleanup on how to segregate their debris, because clearly trash tires and vegetative debris go to different places and we've committed that we will promptly come and remove that debris upon notification and matt for all of us who are going to eventually ask you for this how much lead time the sanitation other apartments need if if a group wants to do it a month in advance six weeks in advance how much time do you need no a week i mean we, we're very responsive i think what we say though is that we can we will remove the debris as promptly as possible so um that may be the same day, it may be within one to two days, just depending on what else is happening on that day, right? Mondays uh, are very busy for us this time of year. We have Saints games, we have second lines, which, which consume a tremendous amount of the department's resources. So sometimes we may not be completing debris removal until Tuesday, but I mean, generally within three to five days, we, we have the debris removed. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. No, thank you. Uh, a lot of those questions that uh, Council Member Jerusalem and Council Member I said, I'm not going to reiterate those, but I want to get back to the tire shredder. Uh, I kind of disagree that you, you wouldn't have any use for the tire shredder because at, at minimum, what it would do is it would help eliminate the density of tires that have consumed uh, our thoroughfares in major, major sites. So to shred it, you know, you would, man, I mean, from a, a tire this big to to the components like this, when you talk about its effect on, on, on nature and our natural topography, it would have a major impact there. So to me, the million dollars, the investment there that's already been put on the side would be worth it, if nothing else, uh, just to save the space and the impact on the land. That, that's, my, that's my opinion. Uh, the other side of it is that uh, th they are, uh, companies that are using uh, a shredded rubber, rubber pellets and, and tires and in manufacturing play spots uh, so that they're safe uh, in putting in, in roadways. I think there's some federal uh, say projects uh, and local projects around the country where roadways use spread, uh, shredded uh, rubber or, or pellets uh, to uh, pave or, or repave or restore. Uh, and then I know the NFL uses uh, in their uh, new kind of turf, uh, they use shredded rubber, rubber pellets in their turf. So when you talk about market, it may not be a universal market, but, but that's such, such is the case with, with, with recycling. What people didn't know about recycling is that 70% of the stuff that was, was recycled actually wound up back in the landfill. But, but so I think we have, I, I don't think we use those excuses to stop us. I think we help create markets, right? Maybe our city can create a create a market. So I would hope that you would revisit 
the conversation about the tire shredder because I, I think it has some use uh, while we're waiting for universal markets to expand. Your response? Yeah, I, I don't think we're, we're in any way discarding the, the idea of a tire shredder, but, but to your point, right now we pick up a tire, it goes in a truck, it goes to Colt, it gets processed. Now Colt uh, diverts the tires to numerous things. It, some of the tires that they process at Colt go to the very things that you referenced. Um, they also go to other things, right, as well. But right now, our, our cost exposure is the resources to pick up that tire, put it in the truck, and transport it. Not to buy a tire shredder, not to operate a tire shredder, not to identify aftermarkets and be responsible for managing those. So I think when we look at it holistically, that's where we're focused on is, is until we can know that that complete process is defined and able to be managed, Right now, we have a limited cost associated with picking up tires. When we have a tire shredder, we're not saying that yeah. in any way we're going to expand the number of tires necessarily that we pick up every year. We're not going to invite the people that are dumping tires to bring tires to us uh, to shred. So right now, we have a, def a very defined cost, the cost of equipment right. resources to pick up tires. I think what we, what we, the unknown is, is what the complete world of cost would look like in that different model. Uh and I really, I appreciate that, but what I'd like you to, I think that's a, uh, that's a government, uh, a public agency outlook of you, right? And, and I'm not, you know, most of us are trained in that, uh, looking at it in terms of how it affects the government's budget or government's resources. But I'd like you to take another look at it, right? As we remove tires from public right of way, from public land, from public spaces, it also makes them more marketable where people would want to invest, where we would, where we may get commercial taxes and local taxes and mm -hmm. great scales of, of economics where we're going to get ours anyway. So I would think we need to take a, a more holistic look at, you know, because anything that damages the land costs you more than your budget. It costs in terms of our life and our quality of life and the air we breathe in our soil. So I would, I, I would think that we need to take a, a more holistic look while you're holistic looking at your budget in terms of its overall impact on what it does to stop economics or stop the market. Because if, if tires are dominating and illegal dumping is dominating a certain area, then we can, you know, we've actually closed off part of the city because people dump. Mm -hmm. That's crazy to me, right? So we've said, because people dump here, we're going to barricade this area so that it's not acceptable to anybody, not an investor, not a resident, not a developer. I agree. You know, so I understand in terms of wanting to protect your budget, but I think there has to be a more holistic look, and especially when you want to talk about market forces and what happens economically, you know, especially when you're using principles of normative economics you know, it's, it's, it's value. So I just think we need to get together and, 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 you know, not just protect our budget, we talk about how we protect our world too. Yeah. Happy, happy to do that. I'm by no means okay. saying that the Department of Sanitation uh, is our expert or has that knowledge when it comes to tire processing. So available at any time to engage with folks that are more knowledgeable than us on this and seek advice and counsel on how to maybe do something differently. Right. Thank you. Th uh, thank you, Mr. Toro. You got it. Thank you. Any, anything you want to close with? No. I mean, we had some breaking news today. Yeah. Again, I think today, uh, again, I felt I woke up and, you know, a <laughs> smile on my face. And uh, for once I got to come here and really. Well, if you're not up, you know, we're all in another place. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I know. But share some positive news. Right. And again, you know, we have a big announcement at one. I look forward to seeing, you know, as many of the council members that okay. can be there to share in that major milestone for the city as we go forward. And again, really looking forward to November 7th. Residents, pay attention to the mailers that are coming. Pay attention to that new collection day. It's important, right? Once a week trash collection, you miss your day. <laughs> it's devastating. We want to make sure everybody is aware of it in case your day is missing, that you know, starting November 7th, what that trash collection day is, that everybody is participating in recycling uh, to help with that and, and taking advantage of these, these resources. So we'll be monitoring the new contracts closely. I think fine tuning once we start and really looking forward to the, the associated results that come with it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. And while we, while we uh, 
Hey, vitamin number four, I want to, all of those residents groups out, out there are listening. I think the one thing we've had the advantage of during these trying times are residents and people who have assisted not only our districts, but assisted our department. So when you talk about posting of signs and, and 311 calls, uh, the, the citizens have been, done a yeoman's job at partnering with, with city government. Thank you. Ms. Carr, any online comments? We have two. First comment is from Ashley Thornton. She says, once a week trash collection is not enough. The neighborhoods stink and the fly population has exploded. My children are disgusted and are afraid to bring the trash can from the curb due to the amount of maggots. I have incurred additional costs by consistently having to buy bleach and fly spray. The combination of being surrounded by trash and combating pests with chemicals is becoming a health concern. I'm afraid rodents will be at the door next. The decision to reduce trash collection to once a week should be rectified by providing additional trash cans to residents who need it at no additional cost. And the other comment is from Kamalita McKee. She says, I and many neighbors in New Orleans East are very concerned about when recycling will resume for the city in general. Knowing how critical illegal dumping and waste plastics are worldwide, we absolutely hate thinking that we are contributing to that problem. When should we expect to be able to resume recycling as a city service? Thank you. And I think we heard that. And uh, now we do have a, a speaker, one of one of my recycling experts, uh, Ben Ben Bagwell. Ben, please, you have two minutes, Ben. Thank you for my two minutes to respond to this lengthy presentation. I would love to have a platform to where I could have a little more than two minutes to actually inform and have a discussion with the people doing the work because that has been hard um, to do especially with this big type of event rolling out and happening. Uh, so since I only have two minutes, uh, my first question is, can we explain what plastics will be recycled if we're gonna educate the community on plastic? Uh, if the sanitation department knows, that would be great to add because that is a particular item. And in this region, only certain plastics are accepted. I wanna also, since I have my two minutes, I'm gonna be grateful to the universe and God for being here because I learned some information that seems to be the way city does business. They're no longer gonna be bringing their glass that they've brought to our facility in Mississippi for the last 13 or 15 years that we've been taking for free, not charging a tipping fee, turning into a usable product, the same exact product the glass half full is making at a scale and have been doing for this lengthy period of time. And for us to not know that we're gonna be losing our biggest source of material to create our product is kind of frustrating and doesn't seem right, but here we are. So I'm glad I'm here. Uh, secondly, I'm gonna reach out and say that if we're gonna do this resource or center, community center, we should maybe do a pilot project at Elysian Fields, which is kind of set up for this, this transfer station, which happens once a week. That facility could be great to have six days a week. I've actually reached out to multiple people here about doing that. I had no clue designs were ending today for that process, but again, glad I'm here to learn all these things. Um, and then lastly, let's go with the tire shredder. I thank you for waking up, honestly, and seeing the potential and caring for our earth and our city and the people. Um, since this money is already allocated and maybe there already is someone who's handling tire shredder. Well, that might be the issue. The money might not be, might, right. That might be the issue. Um, but that could be cool to either do a glass crusher for the city to not transport empty glass since glass half full is going to be moving to not in the city anymore for their new facility in St. Bernard. So it could be cool for the city if this is this great product that can rebuild our city, especially with subsidence, not only our coast, but we could use that sand right here. The sand from our facility in Mississippi is already being used by the RTA right here. That's the story that nobody's saying. That's headline news. Again, this other headline news, I just learned today that the sanitation department is supporting these local contractors who are cleaning up illegal dumping. There's a group of us in the city who are actually doing that. You're gonna hire a group and pay people to do that. We should be considered or at least informed of that and talked to since we're, we could use these resources to create this culture of cleanliness, which we are bringing to our city, which people are really supportive of. And then last but not least, I wanna, my fear is, and thank you for giving me a little bit more than two minutes. I do appreciate it just because this is very important for our earth and our people and kind of just the misconceptions around our recycling. Yes, recycling might be coming back, but 
I'm concerned that if it is coming back, is it still going to be going to Jefferson Parish and then going to Baton Rouge and adding on these tax and costs? And then, like you mentioned, once these added costs keep happening, and now you're over our budget, and then what happens? So typically, 70% of the material, like you said, it's waste. It's not getting recycled. It's cost extra to throw away. You get penalties. So we're paying for it first to pretend we're recycling it. And then we pay for it again when we have to throw it away. That's my concern of having a waste management issue in a resource management lane. Recycling is not waste. It's a resource. It needs to be treated and respected that way. And here's a video of New Orleans recycling. Literally, it's trash. It's right. coming out trash. It's going to the landfill trash. That's what's happening. And that's what's going to keep happening. And that's my big concern is that there are solutions. There are people in the community who are doing real work. Instead of buying a tire shredder, we could buy a mulcher to handle the waste after a storm to generate mulch and soil for our lands and our they're just lack of creative solutions, but they exist and they're not being listened to. So thank you for your time and thank no, you for listening. No, no thank, thank you, Ben. And, and look forward to uh, look forward to those continued conversations. And, you know, my father used to always tell me, be smart enough to know you don't know everything. And I think collectively the people are a lot more brilliant than we give them credit for. Uh, you mind if yes. I, I- Yes, uh, please. Certainly, I appreciate uh, Ben's feedback and, and what he said. I just wanna maybe answer some of his questions because I think they, they align with what we're doing. So he asked about uh, plastics, specifically plastics recycling. So you see in the here are the flyer that's gonna hit mailboxes uh, next week. What we now refer to is when we talk about plastics is we're saying plastics, bottles, and jugs. The city recycles plastics one and two. I'm not gonna in any way commit that most residents are looking at their plastics to say, is this one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. But you do know if it's a plastic bottle or jug very easily and very discernible to know that those are the items that should be going into your recycling cart, none of the other plastics. So hopefully the visual on the card that's going people make them associate plastic bottles and jugs with plastics. And then we get some of that contaminated material uh, out of there. Um, I know the last time Ben was here, he mentioned it again. So the city's contract for, for curbside recycling is inclusive of pickup, transport, yeah. and processing. We do not pay any additional fees. If there's contamination on the back end, that is borne by the contractor uh, that picks up the waste. It's in, that is embedded in our cost. There's no additional cost other than the monthly fee per unit that we pay for curbside recycling there. Um, Ben also mentioned around, around glass, and certainly this has been a recent conversation that's been happening with glass half full, as was alluded to from the questions and comments from Councilmember Harris. I think from the city's perspective, I mean, certainly we are committed to partnering with local organizations. We are extremely grateful to uh, Pearl Particles, which has taken our glass, as Ben mentioned, for the past decade. Um, and, and, are, and again, are, are very appreciative of that but i don't think in any way that should prevent us from looking to partner with local businesses that here in new orleans to keep our resources here and i think actually that's what ben was alluding to when he when he talked about our recycling and the fact that given our lack of processing capacity that we do send our recycling to jefferson parish and baton rouge to be processed because we don't have the ability to process it here in new orleans uh, our, our dream is one day that we will have a processing facility, a world-class state-of-the-art process, processing facility in New Orleans to take the material and process it here. But that doesn't exist right now. And that's a constraint you know, that we deal with every day. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, we have uh, one more, Mr. Uh, Mr. Lang. Mr. Lang, please. Hi there. Uh, thanks so much for letting me come up here. And oh, I probably won't you. take two minutes. But I was really curious, um, within the Department of Sanitation, if there were more conversations taking place around prevention rather than waste management and thinking really around the lines of circular economy, zero waste, um, what sort of um, signage, um, uh, infrastructures that the city can implement to start to really address the issue of plastic. You know, as you're saying, only one and two is recyclable. Well, there's a whole bunch of plastic that's gonna be coming both with Mardi Gras, but every day with, you know, different second lines and other things that are going through. And I was just curious, like what, um, what is the city, I mean, is the city trying to be pro more proactive around waste prevention and not just waste management? Because it's just kind of, that's going to be an ongoing issue that leads to, um, you know, it's, all, it's often linked to a lot of other racial issues of environmental injustice, flooding, flood risk. So I was just curious, like, what's the pulse on that, um, just as a concerned resident of New Orleans? Thank you. No, thank you. That's a great question, Mr. Lane. Mr. Yeah. Tory. 
I mean, we currently uh, spend very little money when it comes to education and outreach. We were, we were blessed to receive this grant of almost $400,000 from the Recycling Partnership to allow us to do this uh, direct outreach to coincide with our relaunch of recycling. I would uh, obviously welcome additional funds and resources to be able to, to strengthen what the city does on an outreach uh, perspective, partnering with the Office of uh, uh, Resilience and Sustainability. But in the past, we have not, that has not been a, a focal point for where we've, we've spent money, unfortunately. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Well, as we prepare for the next presentation, Mr. Torrey, I, I make a recommendation. Uh, we have a lot, especially a lot of young people uh, in our community who have developed some expertise about this, whose, whose number one ma uh, matter of concern is that we have a planet left to inhabit. And, and maybe there needs to be some outreach or meetings with them. Uh, you know, when we talk about crime prevention and a lot of the stuff that I do with beef mediation, uh, it, it's, it, I meet with a lot of those young folk from the street, not in the community. So we have young folk who could commit their life to this, you know, maybe that's meeting with them so they can help to educate the rest of us who, because they've developed, you know, they got some doctorate degrees in this stuff, you know, and, and how we're going to survive. So, you know, I would like to see, and I, and I think council member Harris would agree at some point, uh, meeting with folk like some of the speakers who are here today, who can help us help ourselves. I just think that's smart. Excellent point. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next item on the agenda, please. Next item is the Department of Public Works with an update regarding traffic signals and streetlight repairs. And uh, we uh, have a quorum there. Yes, we do. Would you like to approve the minutes? Uh, yes, I would. Approve, approval of the minutes uh, from September 22nd. Moved by Councilmember Jerusa. Second by Council Member King. All in favor? Aye. Ayes have it so ordered. <laughs> Item number four. Yeah, I think we're waiting for Sarah to sign in. Okay. Let there be light. Good morning, council members. Good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today to give you an update on the Department of Public Works Streetlight Repair and Maintenance Program. Okay, so I'll uh, begin just with a brief overview of the streetlight system just to give our discussion some context and give those who are here in the audience a little bit of understanding of what our responsibility is. So the Department of Public Works is responsible for, for maintenance of approximately 54,000 streetlights across the city. This includes maintenance of our streetlights located on interstate highways and state roads. So just to give you a bit of information about the range of our streetlight assets, they include various types of fixtures, poles, different types of bases and wiring. We have both steel and concrete poles. We have different kinds of residential lighting poles and a range of historical poles and fixtures like you see on Canal Street and, and some of the historic districts. And the entire street light system has already been converted to energy efficient LED lights. Okay, so moving on to our current street light repair and maintenance contractor. So currently we have um, a $4.3 million one-year street light contract in place with All Star Electric. And our contract monitor is a DBE firm, Legacy Professional Services. That's a $1.9 million contract. These are one-year contracts. And basically our monitor is effectively overseeing the work and assigning the work on a daily basis. On average, um, All Star has about five crews um, supporting the efforts daily. They're working to repair different types of outages and they're using a tier system. I think we've talked a little bit about this before, um, outlined here on the slide. We cross-reference we cross our data with NOPD to prioritize our tier one repairs in hotspots, high crime areas, uh, and around schools. And once those repairs are completed, we'll move into the tier two locations that are noted here on the slide. So currently our, our contractor is tracking about 4,200 outages as part of this repair and maintenance contract. And just under 3,000 of those outages have been identified as tier one. I also do wanna mention um, one thing that's a little bit different from our previous streetlight maintenance and repair contracts. 
this contractor is doing monthly nighttime assessments of all the streetlights around the city. So I think that's a great addition that we have to the contract. Okay, so on to slide three, uh, just wanna give you an update on the numbers uh, as of yesterday. So our maintenance crews repair approximately 30 outages a day. Um, that number can increase a little bit, sort of depends on the scope of the repairs that they have. Um, but to date, since the contract's been in place, um, they have made just uh, south of 1,200 repairs across the city. Uh, knockdown poles are certainly a challenge that we've um, experienced around the city. Our contractor has already removed 44 of those knockdown poles. They have reset 145 leaning poles that may have been leaning for various reasons. Sometimes they're hit during accidents, so they've reset 145 of those. And they have 27 major repairs in progress, and those 27 locations um, will affect 156 lights. Um, in making the repairs, our contractor has um, identified uh, some poles that do belong to Entergy, and they are they have reported those uh, repairs over to Entergy and are continuing coordination on that, just about 100. Um, and what they're working toward um, is getting our system, our streetlight system to 90% operational by the end of the year. That, that's the goal. Uh, I do also want to mention, so there are outages um, still associated with Hurricane Ida. Uh, the contractor is estimating that's right around probably 2000. Those repairs cannot be fixed under our maintenance contract. FEMA doesn't recognize work um, that done under a maintenance contract as reimbursable. So those will have to be done under a separate contract. Um, all of the information has already been submitted. The surveys were completed. The information has been submitted to FEMA. Um, so we are working on those contracts. They're, they're likely going to be broken up into four zones and, and we'll start sometime early next year. I uh, did want to give you a quick update on where we are in the French Quarter. So our contractor All Star, they're in the process of addressing outages in the French Quarter. Um, they are utilizing the assessment that was done by the French Quarter Management District, and we certainly appreciate their work on that. Um, they're currently verifying the locations where they can replace poles and replace damaged fixtures. Um, they plan to begin replacing poles next week once the crowds um, have subsided, you know, from Halloween, and they are in the process of doing fixture replacements this week. So they're about 40% complete. Um, they've documented about 30 outages, and seven are going to require some major work to restore power. And then I did want to give just a, a quick update on the interstate because we've received a lot of inquiries um, in this regard. The contractor is, um, again, we are responsible for maintaining the street lights that are along the interstate. So right now our contractor is tracking about 700 outages on the interstates across Orleans Parish. Um, I-610, there is a feeder issue um, that is affecting a number of those poles. Um, all repairs are estimated to com be completed on I-610 probably by mid-November, it could be sooner. Um, it really just depends on how many lane closures it's gonna require to complete those repairs. And those obviously have to be coordinated with DOTD. But the contractor is estimating that all outages are gonna be complete along the interstates by the end of the year. So I think we're gonna be in a markedly better place by the end of the year. Um, and then as we head towards Mardi Gras- More breaking news. More breaking news. <laughs> yes, All Stars estimating that all of the outages on the interstate will be repaired by the end of the year. Councilmember Jim Russo. Thank you. Um, you have more questions from Councilmember Harris than from me. Sure. Um, I'm gonna start with my two though. Um, first is, I think I heard you say that, that the lighting contracts were one year. Yes. Um, do they have options? All of our maintenance contracts are, are one year. Uh, I think we need to change that. And I'm, I'm gonna say that right now because okay. um, my concern, Sarah, is that we're behind on lighting contracts because of what happened mm -hmm. last time. And if and if we continue to do this one year and then there's a three month gap because DBE bidding, whatever happens, then the citizens are the ones who suffer as a result. Yeah, I mean, I, I could certainly look into that um, and, and get back to you. It, what, it, that's absolutely what happened this year. We did put that contract out to bid on time so that we would have a new contract in place when the last one expired, but we had one respondent and they were 
deemed non-responsive. Yeah, and I guess what I don't understand is we have other contracts that maybe have a one to three year term, but then up to five one year options. Mm -hmm. So why maintenance contracts would be different than those? I'll get an answer for you and get back to you. Thank you. Um, the other thing just to kind of, I, I think highlight, you heard it maybe Tuesday, but I, I'll say it again before we get to budget hearings is that you're gonna hear a big push from us on public facing dashboards. When it comes to DPW 311 issues, and I think street lights is, is a perfect example of that. I mean, because I think on the one hand, there's news to report about how many lights have been fixed across all five districts. But then on the other hand, to show people where something is in process, too. Yeah. Okay. I agree. Um, and now on to Councilmember Harris's questions. It was communicated to our office that DPW's contractor is tracking about 700 outages on the interstate across Orleans Parish. There's a feeder issue, and I don't know if it's an all or part of I-610, and that that was slated to be completed by mid-November. Um, I, I, she's asking, I guess, when will the repairs start, number one, and when will notices go out for lane closures? So, I mean, they've already done, they've been doing the assessments. I think that's how they identified the feeder issue. Um, I, I have to get back to you. I'll, I'll, I'll check in with the contractor and find out. All of that will have to be coordinated with DOTD and obviously communicated with people in advance. Okay. Um, I think they're going to try to do as few lane closures as possible, but it's they still don't know. And and I guess is the hope maybe doing some of this at, at nighttime so you're interfering with traffic as yes. long as possible. Okay. Next one is for any new streetlight outages that are reported through 311, what is the current timeline for them to be inspected and then repaired? I can tell you when I'm getting, uh, you know, inquiries that come from council offices, I send them over to the contractor and they're typically assessing them within the week. It really, the time it takes to repair it depends on what the scope of the repair is. If it, if it requires replacement of a base, a, po a pole, it's going to take a little bit longer. If it's routine maintenance, changing a bulb, it's obviously going to be much more quick. So it really does. It's difficult to give you a, an exact answer. I would just say it sort of depends on the scope of the repair, but our contractor, and monitor have been phenomenal and extremely responsive and um, they're getting to things as quickly as they can. Uh, her next question is about how long the current contract with All Star is. Um, and then are they, and they're only gonna fix for a certain amount of time or, or next time, I think, again, sort of like, can we have longer than a one-year contract is implicitly what's here. Um, also, I know that Joe Threat always asks this question, so I'm gonna ask it too. Are there any payment issues outstanding with All-Star? Are they being timely paid? Not with the current contract. So there are um, there were some issues with the previous contract that had a different um, contract monitor. We are working through those invoices and getting them paid. Okay. Um, with All-Star Electric also be performing lighting studies and new street light installations for areas that need street lights installed and not repaired. Will they be performing lighting studies and new street light installations for areas that need street lights installed and not repaired. I guess in other words, are there places that are dark that don't have a street light? And then are they gonna assess, hey, on Smith Street that we actually need a light here? That's a very good question. I mean, right now they're focusing on repair and, and maintenance, um, but I certainly will inquire. I think once we get back to 98% operational, we can, we can certainly look at, um, you know, adding light where there, there aren't enough. All right. Um, now a very specific question. The street lights on the 3,900 and 4,000 blocks of State Street Drive have been out since November of 2021. It was previously reported to my office that the contractor could not access the street lights to do repairs to the excavated streets from the Marleyville project. However, the street has now been paved and is accessible for vehicles. But the street lights are still not fixed. Um, will you please get her a timeline? Yeah, I think um, that's a good question and a good point. I'm actually glad you asked that. So we have a lot of areas where street lights are out that we've got major construction going on. Those particular blocks that you mentioned, they were full reconstruction blocks. Um, so the trucks have to be able to get down there and complete the work. Now that the roadway is in place, I will find out um, why those haven't been addressed so far. But just know um, where there are projects going on, full reconstruction, if the streetlights are out, as soon as those streets are passable, we'll get trucks in there to address them. And if they were damaged, as part of the contract, they need to be addressed as part of that contract. And now, Sarah, I'm going to ask a Joe question. So what happens to people? Which Joe? 
Jeruso the third. Um, which uh, what do we do about people whose street lights are out and there is active street construction? So in other words, what are we telling folks? You know, your street's been ripped up for six months, and by the way, my light's been out since either. Yeah, I'm, it, it's a good question. Obviously, it brings a, a safety issue as well when you we talk about things being out months at a time. If you have specific locations where this is an issue, let me know. I can see if there's something that can be done temporarily until we can get trucks in there to complete Thank you. The then, permanent repairs. And then back to Leslie Harris's last question. <laughs> uh, is the city coordinating with All Star Electric to communicate when streets are finally opened and accessible from JR projects so they can complete? So in other words, that's a continuation of her question. How does yeah. the city alert All Star? I will ensure that that's happening. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Council Member King. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. First of all, I want to say uh, thank you for your responsiveness, I, I've noticed a, a big change in a response from the director of DPW, now that you are the director, uh, you respond to small issues, large issues. So I wanna say publicly, thank you and give credit to where credit is definitely due. So thank you for that. Thank you. Um, I'm glad you acknowledged the French Quarter out, of, of out lights, you get that a lot. But recently there was a uh, you know a carjacking caught on tape in, in Algiers, I think maybe a Monday or Tuesday. Mm -hmm. And a lot of residents complained about Tuesday. Mm -hmm. I think it was Tuesday. 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 Mm -hmm. And a lot of um, complaints about the dark, dark areas in that in that neighborhood off of Vespasian and Murrow. And I know there's a whole lot going on with property in that area, but what can be done to to uh, to add to the, to the to the street lights, or is that an issue of the the abandoned property in an issue? So, are you talking about street lights that are out in that area, or you're talking uh, about there aren't enough street lights that are out there aren't enough? So, on Murrow Street, there's a lot of illegal dumping. All right, and excuse me, though that street is in, in the middle of the Gall Manor, which is probably known, and there's trees growing. The canopy of the trees are very large and that sometimes blocks the street lights. I know that's private property and that, that owner is in uh, in bankruptcy court. So it's anything the city can do to in that neighborhood or in that area since it is private property? No, I mean if illegal dumping's in the area, I don't know if you heard, you know, we, we could we have some new signage that's going up. I mean, light, um, light wise, like light wise. It, it's almost pitch black okay. street at night. We can take a look at it. And, 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 yeah. And around that Vespasian area. Okay. What was the street you mentioned near Vespasian? Merle? Merle, M U R L. Okay. okay. I'll have the contractor look at it. Right. If there are out if there are outages there that can be repaired, we'll certainly address them. If we need additional street lights, you know, that will take a little longer, but I will let you know. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh first of all, uh thank you. This is uh this is really a, a really good I initiative, you know, and, and you know, I, I have a question that I really shouldn't have to ask in, you know, in terms of a question, but uh, what do roaches, rats, and criminals do when you turn on the light? They run. They run, right? And so in reference to what Council Robert King is talking about, even if an area has lights or maybe the lights that are out, Depending on the activity, all right, in that area, lighting can be a deterrent mm -hmm. and lighting can be a stabilization. You know, um, and I think one of the things we haven't done, and I've seen it done in other cities, other cities, they have red light districts, yellow light districts, LED districts, illumination districts, and they will light those areas based on uh, the, 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 the demographics, the type of business, the residential community. We're one of the few cities that I don't, and I'm, I mean, maybe it's because that wasn't my area. Do we have a lighting strategy, right? Right, you know, especially when it r relates to community, because historically, I can tell you where crime happens or where there's been a shooting or where there are drugs. If you go to that neighborhood that has historically been in that, they, that, that area for the last 40 years, I can guarantee you that it either don't have lights, the lights are out, but the lighting is bad. Mm -hmm. Guaranteed. 
Yeah, I think um, I've heard you talk about that before. I think it's very interesting. I think we need to look at it. But well, we well I had this get... initiative we talked about called Light Up the East. Light but I think it's I think it's bigger than just the East now, right? You hear yeah. the people. Council Member King has been fighting for the people in the French Quarter. Mm -hmm. So we there are over 100 and something lights that are out there, and they've kind of flipped the way they think because we create a natural ambiance in that area mm -hmm. that kind of gives this historical context, right? But it doesn't match the time in terms of the activity and criminal activity. So do we continue that historical, you know, uh, 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 aura that we have, or do we light it up because of the activity that we have? And I think those are the questions that, that we can begin to answer today. Yeah, I think we need to move in that direction, but I think we've, we've got to get out of this immediate crisis of, of the amount of lights that we have out, which is right around 6,000. I think once we get back to 98% operational, it wasn't that long ago, it was I think December of 2019 was the last time we were there then we can start thinking strategically about, um, you know, different types of lighting in, in different areas. Uh, they started out in New Orleans East. First of all, thank you uh, for what uh, happened with the lighting on the interstate from Crowder to Reed. Mm -hmm. Made a difference, but there's still those patches there that could help, especially as we begin to exit the high rise and on the other side, and as we move forward. And they put those big lighting stanchions up, the big ones mm -hmm. that were like in Morrison and Crowder, but they have not put the ones up at the 510, 610 mm -hmm. uh, split yet. W when are we, we going to get to those tall lighting stanchions? Because that's kind of like created, not that everything else is lit up, it's created mm -hmm. a dark spot there. Do we have a timetable for putting those up? I will get back to you on that. I will find out. Uh, the high rise. Yep. What's our timetable there? Because even though that's in another district, it kind of leads into the lights that we now have in the east. Mm -hmm. And I think you could kind of set a, an, an atmosphere there and a pattern there if people knew they were coming across, you know, not 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 the darkness into darkness, but from the darkness to light. Mm -hmm. what, what are we what are we talking about in terms of the high rise? By the end of the year. Okay. Uh, the, the underpass at Bullard, uh, the LEDs and the lights are out there. And it's a lot more noticeable because now that we've had, you guys have done the lights on the interstate, it actually illuminates the dark spots, mm -hmm. which is crazy. Right? Yeah, I know theft has continued to be a problem, particularly in the East. Uh, copper, I think then they've switched to aluminum and that's still being, <laughs> that's still a problem. I saw a guy yeah. with, uh, and, and this is why dealing with shopping carts, Shopping carts are the new dump trucks yes. and haulers. Mm -hmm. and, and that's why it's important. And mm -hmm. I, I know Councilman Marino and his office in my office is working together to deal with that. But I, I mean, I saw a guy with two shopping carts full of ca copper wires that had been pulled from somewhere. Yeah. It, it, I mean, it's a, it's a real challenge that we have, we're managing. And that's why you've seen a lot of the outages have been repaired and then they stay on for a little while, they steal the wiring again and we're back to square one. So what are we gonna, so, so once we get the lights, if we know copper is an issue, what is our strategy to maintain? So I actually had a conversation with All Star about this just last week and that's why they made the switch in some locations to aluminum. Mm -hmm. However, they've told us, I think that it's continued to be a problem with aluminum. So I will continue having those discussions. I don't have an answer for you yet today, but, but they are trying to adjust and make it less attractive for them to steal it. Now that the interstate has been lit up, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the criminal element out there, are people who are trying to break the rules, they're a lot more sophisticated today. You know, you do one thing to fix a, fix an issue and they're on to another route. Yeah. So, so if you've noticed that those shootings on the interstate and that gap, that used to happen. I think they've been all but eliminated the last couple months. Yeah, with the lighting. Well, well guess what? Uh, there's a new route is Haynes. So how do we make sure that we're eliminating some of those thoroughfares? Could, could we take a look at the lighting on Haynes in terms of how it complements what we're doing on those other major thoroughfares? Yes. In the interstate? Yep. And, and then the last thing, you know, I'm fortunate enough to have a uh, I, I call it really a council of community activists who actives, uh, activists who are really good at compiling data and working with our office. Uh, 18 wheelers now are their commandeering property and parking lots. They, they've started to move 
out of some neighborhoods because we're doing some enforcement there mm -hmm. and they've heard the conversation, but man, they're taking uh, public property. And it is almost like the parts of New Orleans East that is a 18 wheeler staging ground. Mm -hmm. Yeah, please let me know the locations. We had an issue like this in the Seabrook neighborhood and we were able to send enforcement out and they issued pretty hefty citations, I think $500 each. I, I, can, I can tell you the location right now. Okay. All over. All over. Yeah. Well, I, I can get you yeah. a specific one. Um, under the Woodland Bridge on the goal, right. it's, it's lined with 18, 18 with, in front of do not parking signs. So I know that's, I know that's, uh, that is DPW. So yeah. Um, parking enforcement DPW, they park in front of the do not park sign or no parking on shoulders. How much would it be worth to somebody who drives a big rig to get it back if we hauled it? Uh, uh, my budget chairman, you, you, you think if that big rig, rig is your livelihood and we had an, a big tow rig to haul it? We, we've had this issue in Holly Grove too. Um, it's an issue there that we, we have had consistently that people also park them, right? I mean, instead of pulling them and hauling them to the places mm -hmm. they ought to, they're taking care of free parking. So I'm more than happy to have enforcement. I think you're going to hear a lot of enforcement during this budget season. Well, there's a, there's a bunch of overlap. First of all, I want to thank our budget chairman and thank what Councilman King and Councilman Harris have done with the Quality of Life Committee. I, I think during this, this budget cycle, you're going to, so you're going to see some of this stuff come together because I, I think what we, we can do is while we're in these hearings is kind of put together some of those issues and talk about how do we resource or how do we manage those problem areas mm -hmm. to deal with stuff like uh, uh, 18 wheelers, uh, lighting, dump sites specifically. And the one thing I don't know if you guys have noticed lately, but the district council members, we've really kind of taken the lead on a lot of the stuff that's happening in our district. And I think this is a good time. And, and I was, I'm glad to hear that you guys are kind of getting ahead of some stuff with some breaking news, but I think this budget pr process offers the opportunity not only to catch up, but to maintain a level of, of, of enforcement where we're not, we don't have to catch up again. Folk know what some of the rules are sure. and the fact that it's gonna be enforced, period. Yeah, but if you, if you these locations for the 18 wheelers keep sending them to me. I think a $500 citation is a pretty hefty deterrent. Okay. So. Do, do, can we tow 18 wheelers? Do we have a big towing truck that- No, we will issue those citations. We'll put a boot on it. Oh, they, they can boot it? Okay. So under the Woodland Bridge on the guard, there's at least eight or nine 18 wheelers lined up almost every day. And down the street on Woodland, um, I was told, but it's a state highway, so the city can't do anything. Is that the case? Uh -uh. Yeah, oh, no, that's, that's I don't think that would be the case, but I'll have to look into that and verify. But a couple, maybe uh, 100, 200 yards away on Woodland, okay, in front of I think, the Mayfair apartments, they they keep um, right by Holy Cross University. That it, it stays a uh, Best Buy. It's a Best Buy. Uh, the, the, um, which not the, the truck itself, but the, the the back part of it that stores all the, the stuff. I can't think of what you call it. The trailer, maybe mm -hmm. that stays parked for a couple of days. And so those two areas are, are okay. major areas. We'll check it out. Uh, and can we begin to take a look at it as, as we kind of drive around and look at signalization, look at lighting to establish because there are new there are new truck routes now. They're, they're creating new truck routes, right? And I know we can deal with that because uh, in the 90s, man, we eliminated trucking in the Lower Guard District and parts of uh, the Central City by taking the ramp down, mm -hmm. enforcement, and rerouting folk along Earhart and the Pontchartrain Expressway. So, well, a lot of these truckers, especially if they're accessing the port and the intercoastal and the businesses along that area, yeah. they've created new truck routes. Okay. That's something we'll look at. Councilmember Jerusalem, so you came back. Uh, your name came up again. Yes. Yes, Councilmember Jerusalem. Um, I I also wanted to ask about um, lights underneath bridges too. Yeah. Is that also guided by the work that's being done above Sarah? So. 
for example, on Pontchartrain Expressway, mm -hmm. where you have lights that are out from West End, uh, I think down through at least City Park, Metairie Road. There's also lights that are out underneath the overpass um, as, as you're kind of near that Pontchartrain um, City Park split. Those being those would be done at the same time. Yes. Is that on, are we talking about on 610? Uh, no, this oh. is on, um, this is now, I think, technically part of I-10. So as you come in, yeah. you know what I'm talking about? Yes. As you, as you okay. come in sort of like past the cemeteries and 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 right on the beginning of Pontchartrain Express, where gotcha. yes. the RPC building is. Okay. Um, yeah. I mean, that that is part of that um, between now and the end of the year time frame. Yeah. Other than 610, I mean, I don't have a better timeline, but I will try to Try to see if I can get you all something a little more solid. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Mr. You. Um, we have two cards. Uh, thank, no, thank you guys. Uh, good stuff. Ms. Karen Kirsting. And then Mr. Edward Parker. Good morning. Good um, morning. My uh, comment isn't directly related to street lights, but I'm going to just shine a light on something. <laughs> um, as you know, I've been attending this committee meeting since August to talk about the roadworks uh, problems in our neighborhood of, of Vincennes and State Street Drive. Um, despite, and I will say, the Herculean efforts of DPW and their staff, we continue to have just total craziness going on in our neighborhood. Um, last week, um, I mailed a six page report to various people uh, talking about the latest thing that the workers have done. They decided to add cleanouts to the secondary drains to our homes. There was no design input, there was no warning. They just showed up and started putting these six inch diameter white cleanouts in our yards, in the middle of the sidewalks. They stick up this high next to the houses. There's no rhyme or reason to it. And they're going to be destroyed by lawnmowers and their trip hazards. So you know, we're trying to find some logical way of dealing with that kind of, you know, unprecedented. We're just going to make it up as I go along, you know, work by these crews. My neighbor's water meter was buried 12 inches below grade in a pit of sand where there's now going to be a sidewalk. We had to tell the SWB girl where the meter was. And she said, well, I can't get to it because I'm not digging down you know, uh, 12 inches or more to get to the meter. So you know, again, we're continually frustrated by this lack of coordination. The, the same guy that's running the backhoe is making design decisions, which is not the way I would do things. And we just need some help uh, to you know, better get these contractors to do the right thing, to communicate with uh, the neighbors and to help us move forward. Um, you know, I say it in jest, but some of my neighbors are now at Stockholm syndrome. We really need to, you know, get a better grip on this work. And I appreciate being able to bring this to your attention again. No, thank you, Ms. Kersing. I think you've been consistent yeah. uh, at acknowledging what's been done, but also the lingering problems. And I think you've helped us in terms of getting uh, our arms around a lot of the stuff to know that a lot of those nagging things that should be inconveniences are hardships now. Right, it is my civic duty. I Thank mean, I'm, I'll go on record on that and I'll continue to do what I can Thank you. to bring it to your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Edward Parker Jr. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Parker. And thank you, you new council. Please continue to do what you're doing. Madam, public works, street side, We've been waiting since Ida, street sign, Henley, H-E-N-L-E-Y Street at Curran. We've been waiting since Ida. Street light, it's been out now going on three months. MP26. That's at uh, Corrin and Lamb Road. Do you deal with abandoned houses? No. What about abandoned cars? Yes. Okay, abandoned cars. Seven to 800 Henley, H-E-N-L-E-Y Street, New Orleans, Louisiana, 70126. Do you need uh, make and model or whatever? If you have it, that would be great. Yes, ma'am. 
at uh, 7840, 7842 Henley, same block, Black Mazda, no license plate. It's under the carport. 7830, 32, Henley, right next door. Black Audi, ASL, license plate, Z E R 964. 783032, same address. There's a gray Mazda, Ultima. No license plate. Uh, 18 wheeler. 18, uh, where's that? Uh, uh, wow, that 18 wheeler. That's in the 7800 block of Henley. And also, we have a, uh, those trailers are being parked on Morrison, that would be between, what's that? That would be between again Castle, Castle Manor and uh, Lake Castle. It's where uh, we used to have before Katrina, uh, we had what, uh, that uh, uh, hamburger place. Yeah. It's over there where uh, the, the guys play the pool yeah. and all that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And are you the new head, my dear? Yes, she. Yeah, yes, she is. Could we get? She's. she's I did. I'm already. Could I get a card? No, get it done. Yeah, no, she's got you, Mr. Parker. <laughs> got you. Thank you, and Mr. Parker. Thank you. That, appreciate you. Uh, Thank you. Um, I would hope that uh, I think some of the things we have uh, inter, uh, uh, intersect. Uh, we heard from Mr. Tory earlier, and we heard from folk about uh, dumping on tires and, and the like. And I, I want you to kind of wrap your head around how, you know, we shouldn't constrict our city because people are not following the law, right? So we have public right of ways that have been closed. We have service roads that have been closed because people say we want to do illegal things in this area. So they have commandeered. It doesn't stop them, right? They still dump, even though we've blocked off uh, taking, taking this public access, Councilman Jerusalem, so from the public. So, yeah. so, so yeah. if we continue to allow everybody who wants to, to do something wrong all of us gonna be piled on top of each other in the same neighborhood. So that's the, the solution isn't to cut off public access to what could be valuable pieces of land, a street so people could access access their businesses or their property. The solution is stopping the person who's doing the ham, uh, the, the harm. Yeah, Morrison and Gannon is what I'm thinking about. Yeah, yeah. Morrison and Gannon is one. The, the service road, yeah. uh, you know, along five ten mm -hmm. and and six ten. The, that 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 access point to the chef around a uh, uh, bullet uh, and 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 Dwyer, mm -hmm. you know, we start to block off large swaths of land because someone who's doing something illegal has said we're going to use this for and and it doesn't stop them, but it, what it does is stops the public from accessing property in areas that they pay taxes for. That just seems like a crazy way to do it to uh, uh, to me. So I would hope that you and Mr. Tory and others, and especially because there's such an emphasis on quality of life with what Councilmember King and Councilmember Harris and Councilmember Jerusalem are doing, how do we expand our community, not constrict our community? And how do we begin to give value back to the land so that people can invest, not stop or cut it off from people who are actually doing the wrong thing or something illegal? I just think it has to be a philosophy. I'm not saying you guys aren't thinking like that. But I think we have, I think we can be a lot more proactive if we look at it like that. Oh, they're dumping here. No, that's a valuable asset if we got to get them to stop from dumping. No, we blocked off the street because they're putting tires there. No, that's access. That's another access road for, for potentially for development. So I just think we need to start thinking the other way. 
I agree with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any online comments? Yes. First comment is from Isha Greeley. She asked, will there be crosswalk signals added in addition to traffic signals and streetlight repairs for crossing the street and safety concerns for our pedestrians? Candace Taylor, representing NOE Task Force, says, please monitor the oversized 18 wheelers that are parking along Paris Road, blocking the sidewalks. What are we doing to offer an alternative to these vehicles to park? I contacted Lowe's and filed a complaint regarding the 18 wheeler vehicles parking on Reed Boulevard. According to the truck stop route, they are allowed to pass through, but there is nothing that says they can park and remain only to unload or unload. There needs to be adequate and organized parking for these vehicles instead of taking over our residential neighborhoods, operational commercial properties. NOE is not and will not be one big truck stop. And the last comment is from Kamalita McKee. She says a true bulwark for New Orleans East. Oops, sorry. Uh, good morning, and I first want to take this opportunity to thank you, Councilman Oliver Thomas, who has been a true bulwark for New Orleans East. He has been our defensive wall, our champion, and is very much appreciated. For over a year now, I have chaired the New Orleans <clears throat> East Matters Coalition Task Force, and one of our primary goals was to get 100% of our streetlights turned on. In both meetings and emails, we have been promised that this goal would be met by the end of summer, now the end of the year. Yet, as a crossover into New Orleans East from the Seabrook Bridge and down Haynes Boulevard or Chef Winter Highway between Bullard and Michu, the lights are still out. In past meetings, we were told that the four new subcontractors were going to be able to, take, to get all this done. I do know a lot of people are working very hard, but having our lights out makes our quality of life difficult. And it, it gives haven to those who want to operate in darkness. I do hope that in this meeting, my concerns will be allayed and that I will hear that the lights will be on by or before year's end. That would be wonderful, uplifting, almost spiritual moment for New Orleans East to go into the new year fully lit. Thank you. First name, Hallie, last name, Louie. Uh, <laughs> any good comments from the committee before we, we close this out? Uh, Ms. Prodes. Yeah, last thing I would say, I'm, I'm personally staying very close to this. I know how um, important an issue it is. So I'll be very involved attending all status meetings until we get back to 98%. And then just quickly, an update on traffic signals. We are actually in pretty good shape right now. We have three um, traffic signal outages, Earhart and Dupree, the cabinet was hit. It's gotta be replaced. That should be done within the next two weeks. Magazine and Felicity, also a cabinet replacement. That repair is gonna start as soon as Earhart and Dupree is completed. And then the last one, Canal and Durbany also requires a cabinet replacement and that will pair with start with Well, that. one thing we know, working together works. Uh, it does. Uh, really, as I'm proud of my colleagues, as, as the district council members have really stepped up. I think we have some policy things we can do, some quality of life things we can do. And I'm looking forward to a continued relationship where the citizens know uh, that their tax dollars are working for them. So we appreciate it. Uh, can I get Thank a motion you. to uh, adjourn? Move. Move. That wouldn't be from me. Move by Miss. <laughs> move by Miss Curran. That's to let you go because because all your yes, hard work. Go ahead move and by, please move. <laughs> move by Councilmember Jerusa, second by Councilmember King. All in favor? The meeting is adjourned. Thank you, all. Miss Janet. Good to see you. <laughs>